Uh, by getting engaged and uh, being active in um, all the organizations that's already uh, out there, um, especially when you talk about places like NAACP, I know they are open and um, fighting the issues of immigration, um, the uh, social justice issues of uh, the criminal justice system of how the system um, discriminates against all minorities um, and fighting on that front and getting involved. I was arrested uh, in 1984 for rape and murder of a white newspaper copy editor uh, here in Western Salem, North Carolina. Um, I was arrested at age 19, and I served 19 and a half years in prison. Um, I had two trials. Um, first trial was um, a jury of 11 whites and one black, and the second trial was um, a whole white jury. And I was convicted and uh, sentenced to life in prison, uh, being one vote away from the death penalty. Um, I spent um, 19 years in prison going from 13 different prisons in North Carolina. Um, in 1990, uh, before my second trial, uh, my attorneys asked, was there any DNA involved? Uh, was they able to collect the DNA and they, like, they said that uh, the DNA was uh, too degraded to be tested, which was a lie, uh, because right in their files was a report from the FBI that they could do DNA testing, which was called PCR testing, which was a high grade of testing. And uh, it was three years later during the MAR hearing, a motion for appropriate relief hearing, that um, by the grace of the law, my attorneys asked um, for one statement of another witness, and because the prosecutor didn't want to turn it over, the statement from the FBI about the DNA was stuck to the statement that the judge made him turn over, and that's how we was able to find out about the DNA. And it was the testing was done in '93, came back in '94, and and um, August of '94, it proved that it wasn't me that committed the crime, um, but the judge ruled that DNA didn't matter, and, and um, my case was appealed all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, and the U.S. Supreme Court upheld it, and uh, coming up with different scenarios why uh, DNA didn't matter, uh, going so far as to say that the person that I could have killed the person and someone could have came along after she was dead and raped her uh, to justify the DNA and it was only um, <clears throat> Christmas Eve uh, 2003 um, that I was released on bail after they found the person who actually committed the crime and in February of uh, 2004 I was exonerated. Muslims play a, a, a biblical role in it because, <clears throat> one, when I first went in the prison, I was, I mean, when I was first arrested, I wasn't Muslim. Uh, I started learning about Islam, and I became Muslim. But um, it was through um, my father-in-law, who was now my father-in-law. He, was, he wasn't my father-in-law then, but... Um, 
that first introduced me to Islam and helped me understand um, the basics of Islam and that gave me the strength and determination to to rely on Allah to endure the 19 years. To to speak out against the injustices, to the Muslim community needs a voice for those who don't have voices. And in the climate that we're in today, where Islam is being attacked from all sides, um, the justice system um, that has never been fair to minorities, period, and um, who continues to have all these flaws and the Muslims need to be involved and need an organization that can speak for the Muslims uh, to to go along. Um, <clears throat> give you an example. One of the things in North Carolina that we fought against was the moratorium on the death penalty because we believe that you cannot give the death penalty to people when they don't receive a fair and just trial. And <clears throat> During this whole time, uh, not only could I count the African Americans that was involved at the General Assembly uh, pushing this, but the number of Muslims that, for one reason or another, didn't feel that they had a voice to be there. And so, if we have a collective body, a voice that could speak out for those who can't speak, because there's injustices being perpetrated against Muslims for. Uh, driving down the street with a kufi on um, and being pulled over and questioned and <clears throat> with, without an organization that can speak for them and can speak to uh, the authorities about the injustice, then we can continue to be victims. Uh, if it was not for one person, um, I wouldn't be sitting here today because um, Allah blessed this one juror to not to give me the death penalty. And if he'd have given me the death penalty, then I would be I wouldn't be here today. So um, one person do make a difference. Uh, Allah gives you power to do all things. Uh, if it wasn't for Larry continuing to keep it before the community, um, Larry's voice, uh, who we played basketball, that's, a, that's the only thing I knew about him. We played pickup basketball in the YMCA, and it was because of that pickup basketball that he knew what kind of character a person I was, and came and and pulled in the community and people to um, know that I did not commit, that the person that he knew that played basketball with did not commit this crime. And it was because of that one voice that he carried um, that I'm here. Because, you know, I don't, I don't think um, Allah blesses just one person. He blesses one person and he blesses others and he gives others the chance to fight. You want for your brother what you want for yourself. Um, and in a system that continues to heat injustice, you know, justice, um, our criminal justice system is supposed to be about blind justice, but when it's based upon how much money you have or what class you come out of, then that's not justice, and all Muslims need to stand up and fight for that.